Well, hello, I'm Debbie Kitterman, and welcome to Dare to Hear the Podcast, where we equip you and challenge you to dare to hear the voice of God. I am really excited to introduce my next guest who wrote this amazing book called Dream Brave. But if you don't know who she is and you haven't heard about um, her ministry or anything, I want to introduce her to you. So her name is Y Gia, and she is a multi award winning international humanitarian doctor and speaker. She was selected for Forbes Asia's inaugural 30 under 30 list. She has been featured in numerous international media outlets and is the founder of kite dreams ministry and kite song global. And uh, we'll tell you how you can connect with her at the end of the podcast, but Y Gia, welcome to dare to hear. Thank you so much, Debbie. I am so excited to be on your podcast and I love that it's entitled Dare to Hear because what better way to hear the voice of God than starting with a dare, like a challenge. I love it. <laughs> yes, well, and you do that a lot in your book too. I When oh. this came across and I was like, oh, I need this because in November of this last year, I actually did a Dream Big with God seminar. Um, so all of you out there that took that seminar, you need to go buy her book book dream brave because it is amazing it is amazing i'm having issues Aww. with my lighting today so sorry about that um but I, I thought that we should just start right at the beginning and just kind of talk to us about what is the story behind your book dream brave Wow. Thank you for asking, Debbie. Firstly, I want to see how moved I am to see how many post-its there are in your book. I mean, that has been my heart that people would go into the book, not just, you know, um, skimming through it, but really diving deep. And what I've done is to take Hebrews 11 and kind of unpack it with, um, unpack it, but through the lenses of personal experience and guiding people to kind of see their own experiences through the eyes of God. And so when I saw all those colorful post-its, it was just such a reminder of me of, you know, when I saw all the different colors of the diverse ways that God speaks to us and how throughout our whole lives, it's, it's like a book, isn't it? And what we want to do is to allow God to like, highlight things in our lives and allow ourselves to take notes from what he's teaching us all the time. So to answer your question, how this book came about, um, the funny thing was when I first started, I had a very small dream. It was just simply to record down the anecdotes of the crazy adventures and testimonies that God had brought us through when my husband and I had gotten married. Um, we spent a year in Uganda. So it was just supposed to be a little book of testimonies. I was going to self-publish it, you know, um, just locally and it was just going to be a small thing but as i wrote it i just kept feeling the nudge of the holy spirit saying challenging me um that yj you have done four picture books they have been self-published would you want to would you want to write a story for a larger audience and I remember feeling so afraid. I had to address the shame that I had in my heart that I've been carrying all this while. Because since I was a child, I, I always felt ashamed of my name. It's not a girl's name. It's not a girly name. Um, it's not even an English name. And people find it hard to remember how that's tied to my identity was that uh, I found out as I was growing up that I was expected to be a boy. Mm. And in the Asian culture, that's very much, um, you know, a thing. It's a, like a badge of honor. And I wasn't, and I was the last child of the family um, in a household of girls. So it was it was a blow to everyone. Um, and yet when God invited me to step into this adventure with him, I felt like he was telling me, Waija, I see you. And I use the small and the crushed and the broken. So why are you afraid? Mm -hmm. And so that began my journey. So in fact, as I write, as I wrote Dream Brief, it was an evolution from just a series of testimonies in Uganda to it becoming my life story and weaving that into how God has been actively speaking to me. It reflects really my heart that every person can have a living, active relationship with a God who is loving and pursuing us all the time. Yeah. 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 Yeah, this book was so good and so timely for me. I was even just having a conversation um, with my husband before I got on here with you. And I was like, 
man, the testimonies of faith and the amazing miracles, like it increased my faith. That's what testimonies do, right? They increase our faith yes. to believe the possible, yes. but just all the ways. But also what I really loved, Waijia, about what you shared was you were real. You were transparent. Oh. You were honest because you, I mean, you said, and then I doubted, but why did I doubt? Because God had come through in all these ways. And I was like, huh. Okay. This is so good. This is so good. And so refreshing to see the uh -huh. way God moves. And, you know, God has been talking to me lately about remember, remember the things I've spoken, mm -hmm. remember the things I've done. And I yeah. said, yeah. I'm going to have to go back and remember, because I don't know if I could come up with 20 testimonials of his big faith, like what you shared in this book. And, and so I am sure you will, Debbie. <laughs> It was kind of a challenge for us. I said, we need to sit down and do that. We pastored a, a senior pastor at a church um, together for eight years. And I'm like, I'm, I know there are some, we just got to sit down and yeah. remember them. Um, yeah. Early on, I don't know uh, the intro. I read everything in the book, YGA, but wow. the introduction, I was like, oh my goodness, I am highlighting like every, all, every other page had all these highlights in it. But I, I was struck by this right in the very beginning. You said the truth is that to believe in a dream requires not not just vulnerability, hope, and courage, but also risk. It demands the brave acceptance of the possibility of failure. And I was like, oh, oh yes. Yes. okay, so kind of unpack that. And oh. why, why, why do we need to understand that we, there is a possibility of it, but it requires that vulnerability, hope, and courage, and oh. risk. Wow, Debbie, even as you were you were reading and sharing that, I had goosebumps all over me. I kid you not when I say that sometimes when I go back and read the book, I, and I don't mean to sound presumptuous <laughs> but, or, or narcissistic or anything, but when I go back to read the book, sometimes I, I get floored. I get a Holy Spirit encounter because I knew that the book was written alongside the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And even just recently when my husband and I were really struggling with as to whether the Lord was calling us to relocate to Tanzania and Africa long term with our family, we have two little girls. Um, I, I felt that sense of vulnerability. I felt that sense of fear. And at the same time, I realized that that is exactly where God wants us to be. Mm. As you read that quote, what, what it reminds me of is that to just tell anyone, even just God, your dream, it's being so vulnerable because you're admitting that this matters, that what God has put in you matters, and most importantly, that God matters. Because if you acknowledge that he has put that dream inside of you and you acknowledge it, it's like admitting, oh, wow, this is way bigger than I thought, but I'm going to acknowledge it and embark on it anyway. And so that risk comes because with our own human hands, there is just no way that we can fill a God-sized dream. But I think that's exactly when we can invite God to step into our stories because he's calling us on an adventure. Mm -hmm. he, he didn't give us those dreams for us to hustle and strive towards, which is always my tendency. You know, I'm like the overachiever maximizer. Let's do it my way. Come on, God, you can help me, you know? Me too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I just feel like he's just wrecking me, like changing my paradigm saying, you know, this is a risk you're going to take. It's going to be bigger than you. No matter how hard you hustle and strive, you're never going to reach it. So why don't you just lay yourself down and just surrender to me? And that's, that's, that's really the journey that I still am embarking on day by day. <laughs> and I think, I think we all are. And, and this was, your book was so challenging and um, inspiring. And there, there just was so many things that spoke to me on so many levels. Um, you talk about kite dreams. And, you know, when I was reading your bio, your ministry is Kite Song Global and Kite Dreams Ministry. Yeah. But can yeah. you kind of um, share what is a kite dream and why is it important wow. that you have them? Wow. Thank you for sharing, Debbie. A kite is very symbolic to me because it's anchored on a cross. Mm. And without the wind of the Holy Spirit, a kite cannot fly. And because of that, a kite represents to me the dreams we all have. 
that God wants us to fly in His way and His time. And the kite is very special to me because the very first time I went overseas on a youth expedition trip with a school, it wasn't a Christian trip, but majority of the people on that trip were believers. And I wasn't a believer back then. It was the first time I kind of like, you know, was immersed with a group of Christians. And the amazing thing was we were visiting an orphanage. And this little boy, as I left the orphanage, he gave me a gift. And he shared with me that his dream was to become a doctor. And that was my dream at the time too. You know, I was applying to medical school. But what broke my heart was that he gave me a gift of a kite mm. that he had made from sticks and a trash bag. And that symbol was so poignant for me because it represented the dreams that we all have. And yet the very unequal opportunities we have to pursue them. And that's what um, you know put a burden on my heart to do more for those who had less than me. And it started kind of, you know, my journey into humanitarian work and all that. Yeah. 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 I, I, your, your story of being 18 and coming back and, and having this, what others said was impossible, um, that mm-hmm. you were like, I'm just going to do this and, and raising funds to help purchase a home mm-hmm. for uh, children. I, I was touched by that. I was moved by that. And I think it gives people the possibility to, dream big and to dream brave with courage. Um, You say that we must hold on to God's promises and take action toward them in faith, even when we can't see the end. Talk to us a little bit about that, because I think I think that's where some people get Um, frozen is they can't see the end. And so they don't hold on to God's promises or take action. Wow, that is so true, Debbie. Sometimes we can get so immobilized by fear, and that is very, very normal. One one verse that has always encouraged me is Psalm 119-105, when it talks about, you know, your word is like a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. A lamp is like, you know, it's it's small, but it just lights enough light for the next step. And so one thing I encourage myself and others with is, if you can't see the end, if you can't see the whole blueprint, just take God's hand and just take the next step. Even right now, when we think about moving or relocating long-term to the mission field, it feels so hard. I almost feel like God made me write this book to remind myself of what I need because I I am afraid um, of what the future might hold. This this month, I, I would have quit my job and then we would be waiting for our work permits to get done. And right now, there, there seems to be a, a glitch, it's a delay. So it's that sense of, God, you have given me the vision. I don't know if I'll get there, but you know what? I'm going to take it one step at a time. And at every step, I think it requires a fresh vulnerability because at every step, you're telling God, God, I'm taking this step forward. And yet, it's kind of like a paradox. I'm holding on to you. I'm clinging time, taking the next step forward. And yet... I'm fully letting go. I'm fully surrendering. And all that time, it's this tension, it's the paradox of it all that we are clinging on to God and yet holding loosely. And yet we are believing so much in the dream and yet surrendering it completely. And I think it's this beautiful tension that keeps us you know, on our toes, but also it keeps us growing and being stretched in God. Yeah. yeah. That's so good. Um, what would you say is at stake if we ignore God's dreams for us? Oh, my, Debbie. I think if we had a full grasp and understanding of what was at stake, we would just throw ourselves so much more into things. Because when I think about it, I think about what was at stake when, when God called Abraham up the mountain Right? God had given Abraham the vision of being a father of many nations. He had, he had spoken to Abraham, and yet he required Abraham to take that those many steps of faith. It wasn't an easy journey. It was a three-day journey to the mountain, and then a many, many, many more steps up the mountain. I mean, what, what, was, what was Abraham thinking? It was hard. And at the end, when God told him to to like, you know, sacrifice your beloved son, Isaac. I'm just thinking the whole time Abraham knew the surrender that he would have to make. And yet it was so difficult for him to take each step forward. And so with that, I think it just reminds us that at every step of the way, we just got to keep moving forward, keep trusting God and keep allowing him to bring us to where he wants us to be. 
because that vision is meant to propel us forward and to encourage us that no matter how difficult the journey is, we can trust God with it. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. Um, You talk a lot about um, people and occasions where people close to you and people around you made you question or doubt the dreams or the the things that God had asked you to trust him in and take risks. So how can how can we as believers deal with cope with the naysayers that mean well, but aren't really helping sometimes? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, if you are in a place where there are naysayers, you are in a good place. (laughs) That's what I kind of say. You're in a good place, but it's a hard place to be, especially if people that you really love and admire, people who mentor you have different kinds of thoughts. And I think it's it's really been a journey for me, especially, I mean, I I think no matter what culture we come from, um, as long as the voice is coming from someone we love. It's very, it's very precious. But if, especially if you're like a, in a culture like, like, like you know, like mine, for example, where hierarchy is very enmeshed into the system, it can be even more difficult. Mm-hmm. And what I encourage people is to, um, you know, remember that mentors are important. Remember that submission to, to you know, people in authority is really important. But more important than that is the voice of God. Mm-hmm. So. So it's exactly like what your podcast is entitled, Dare to Hear the Voice of God. And, you know, when 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 Moses, for example, you know, was born, how, how was his legacy left behind? Even when King Herod, he told everybody to kill all the newborn boys, who defied him? It was Moses' parents. It was the midwives, the Hebrew midwives, right? And they chose to hear the voice of God above their authorities. And I don't say this lightly because I don't want people to go around saying like, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's normal to like, like they'll be like a serial rebel all their lives. You know, I don't think that's what God is calling us to do. There are lots of verses about us being obedient and submitting to authorities, right? But it's at those moments, you know, Debbie, when, when you have this Holy Spirit moment, right? You just know and you know that it is the voice of God. We want to check it with, with our spirit, I think, when we walk intimately with God. And somebody told me this recently, which I thought was so true, because I had come to kind of a difficult point uh, with our, our plans to, you know, relocate or you know thinking about what our next step should be about missions and i i got into this tangle with um a particular older person uh, like like a mentor a spiritual mentor right and it was very difficult and someone reminded me gave me a very good piece of advice and said never think that this is a poll don't think that oh nine out of ten mentors and friends said this is a good idea and one said no Sometimes that one voice is the important voice that we need to hear. But more importantly than just heeding to be being swayed by, oh, those nine voices or that one voice, it's about putting all the voices before God and saying, God, help me discern. And that discernment process, I think, is challenging, but it is also what draws us close to God because then we really need to press in and say, God, speak to me. Speak to me through my circumstances, through my inner peace, through prayer, through the word and through all these different facets of our lives, I think God becomes real to us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's yeah. So good. That's so good. Um, I don't know if you have plans for this, but just kind of as you're talking and I'm looking over all of yeah. the and all of the quotes that I pulled out, you could totally oh. have like quote pictures from all of your stuff. There's a bunch of oh. nine, two sentences that are just amazing. So this is one of them. And legacy, legacy has been a theme that's on the heart of the father right now for several years. And it's kind of this season. And you said this, you said your faithful sowing might blaze the trail for others behind you. Your humble plowing might inspire generations beyond your own. And I want you to talk about that because when we dream brave it's not just for us it's for those that are looking at us watching us and doing life with us and even for future generations so talk a little bit about that wow oh debbie you just hit a a very tender spot um when you use the word legacy because i've been wrestling with this idea of legacy for a long time um you know as we as we get older I think the idea of a legacy becomes more and more important. We're thinking to ourselves, when I die, what happens and what is the legacy I leave behind? Ironically, I do 
I do find it interesting that when Jesus lived, I don't think he had that in mind. I don't think he thought to himself, hmm, what kind of a legacy am I going to live be- leave behind? And that can sometimes be very prideful. It's like, how do I build myself up, my ministry, my adventure, so that I can leave behind this legacy, right? And I, I get, I get uh, a little concerned when I hear the word legacy being used in that way, because then the purpose becomes leaving behind a legacy. But interestingly, Jesus, I don't think, had the mission of leaving behind a legacy as much as he did a mission of being obedient to the Father. Mm. And I think the legacy becomes a result of our obedience. And so I think when we focus on being obedient, I think the outflow of that is a natural legacy because then people are looking to you, seeing the fruit of your obedience. Mm-hmm. And that is what they will savor for generations to come. It was your obedience to sow that seed, to plant that tree, to water it, to nurture it, that rose it into full bloom and fruition mm-hmm. for other generations to savor. Yeah. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah. That is so good. Because yeah. I think I think it, we can easily take it out of context with that word. I love yeah. the way you just yeah. did that because, you know, our family picked up and moved across the country much similar to like what you were, you know, going to the mission field and doing things and making sacrifices. God was coming through for you. But for us, it was like, ah, I'm like, Lord, why? And he said, because I'm going to deposit you and I'm going, you're going to, to help people where I'm planting you. And I think yeah. that's what Jesus was focused on. He was focused on the people. He was focused on what his mission was. And out of that became mm. a legacy of what he left and, so true. and your legacy in this book, there, there was just, there's just, so many things that I'm like, I want to talk about this. I want to talk about this. Um, I do, um, I do want to talk about, you talk about building your arc of faith and this Mm -hmm. was so good. I was like, I I like have stars. Don't forget to ask her about this. So kind of (laughs) what is an arc of faith and why is it important that we need to build an arc of faith? Wow. Wow. Debbie, I love that question. Wow, an arc of faith to me represents building and sowing and plowing to something, even when you don't see the outcome. I mean, when God told Noah to build this ark, I mean, what was he thinking? He must have been thinking, this is crazy, like a storm for 40 days, a flood, really? Like, like, how does that even look like? And I'm just thinking, when you build an ark of faith, what are other people saying? What were people saying to Noah and his family? But he was so faithful, he just kept doing it. And God had given him a blueprint. And all he needed to do was do it step by step, bit by bit, every day. And the the chapter that you talked about, Building Your Ark of Faith, is actually anchored on my journey um, to the States when I believed that God had called me to pursue my Master's of Public Health at Johns Hopkins, but I had no funding. I didn't know how it was going to happen. There were just so many obstacles. And yet, at every step of the way, God just told me, just apply for this scholarship, just do that. And and maybe, you know, people who are listening might, must be thinking, oh, that's a natural for her, you know, like for her to get into Johns Hopkins. It's not that hard. Or uh, maybe she had a stellar CV. But what, they, but, but what some of you might not know was that I nearly failed through medical school because of an eating disorder, because of depression. So for me to even take that hurdle, to think I might be qualified to apply for that scholarship was a huge step of faith even. Because I looked at all the other interviewees, they were way more qualified than me. I was the only one with like a very colorful transcript, you know, with only one A in my my entire medical school. And that was for like a community health project. You know what I mean? I was not academic at all. So it was about taking that step of faith, even when you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, I think about Noah when I was in his shoes, how I would have felt building that ark. Mm. And so when I think of him, it, 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 it reminds me that sometimes we may not see the end, but we can keep on plowing. Just take the next step. And as my husband, who's more lighthearted and, you know, jovial, he would say, just eat the elephant like one bite at a time, you know? <laughs> Yes, that's good. That's good wisdom. And in fact, I do want to, I do want to talk about your husband um, because he's a dream champion for you. And um, he does play a huge, big supporting role. He supports you in a lot of stuff that was evident throughout the book. And um, so how does he offer support to you and how can we um, support the God given dreams for others around us? Because I think there's a lot of lessons that I learned from your writing about your husband husband cliff and and just really how he supports you wow thank you so much debbie 
Ah, this is an interesting question because a couple of days ago we were interviewed by a, a documentary film crew and they asked us about emotional labor in our marriage because we're kind of an interesting couple. He's a stay-at-home dad and I, I'm uh, so-called, like they label me like the sole breadwinner. Um, but the funny thing is, Cliff and I have sought to kind of flip the narrative that he's actually not supporting me. We're actually supporting each other in our dreams. And actually, the amazing thing is that what people see from the outside is that, wow, she's dreaming big dreams. He's supporting her. But actually, in our home, behind closed doors, what actually happens, and we had fun talking about this, is that Cliff as I love the word you use, he is the dream champion. He actually sees the vision before I do. And he challenges me to go after it. And I'm usually the one chickening out. I'm like, Cliff, it's the pandemic, it's COVID-19, we have a baby to nurse, you are immunocompromised. I shouldn't be going to the front lines. I have been out of clinical work for too many years to do this. And he's like, why, Jia? This is what you've trained and dreamed your whole life to do. Now get out there and do your thing, you know. Or when I received like the um, the call to assistance from Africa and the World Health Organization, and United Nations, saying, "Would you like to be deployed for six weeks in the field?" And I was like, "No, I don't want to do that. That is scary. I don't want to." And Cliff is like, "Why, oh, yeah, like." This is God inviting you into an adventure. What are you waiting for? And I think it's when we put the other person above ourselves that we can support one another best. Because my concern was, Cliff, how can I support you if I'm in the field, right? For six weeks, you're alone with two little girls, two toddlers, it's gonna to be insane. And he's like, no, how? It's gonna be so much harder when you are in the field. How can I support you better? And I think, um, of course, there are times of tension in our marriage, right? Where we feel like, hey, I'm supporting you so much. How come you're not supporting me? Uh, we have those hard conversations. It's, it's real, you know, I'm just keeping it real. It does happen. Um, but we've found over the years that the best way that we so-called support each other is by um, submitting to one another in love and, you know, almost like competing to support each other best because that's the best way, I think, that we can champion each other's dreams. I yeah, love, I love that. I, I, it was so encouraging to, you know, just kind of read your story of faith of uh, championing um, each other really in the different things and um, really how you sought God through it all. Um, you have 20 testimonies throughout the book. And um, I wanted to ask, um, which one would you consider the most unexpected story that you shared in the book? Ah, wow. <laughs> Maybe that's a challenging one, you know? <laughs> wow. You know, I got to say this, I feel like the most unexpected or, or the, the testimonies that leave the greatest mark in our lives is often the ones that are most personal. You know, we think to ourselves, you know, we are like, you know, we want to dream big, do big things for God, we want to see God move in ministry. But the funny thing is, I feel like God speaks to us when it's our littlest wishes, the littlest desires of our hearts are fulfilled. And the one that is etched on my heart the most is actually about uh, my firstborn's owl backpack. I love, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was insane. Oh my goodness. Debbie, we had moved from, God was calling us to move from Canada back to Singapore and it was a huge move because I just had a newborn. We had no place to stay in Singapore. Uh, we were coming back from Canada because I just finished my master's at Johns Hopkins. Cliff was pastoring a church there. We were en route. We were coming back because I had to finish serving by contract as a medical doctor with the government. So God made it very clear. You have to honor your word, finish your contract. So it was kind of like, oh gosh, Lord, what am I going to do? Like how, I, I don't even know where we're going to stay. It's such a big transition. It was so stressful during the move. Now, Sarah Faith, my firstborn, had a little owl backpack. It's like her one and only favorite thing that she brought back. And along the way, somehow during the move, I lost it. And she kept asking me like, mommy, where is my backpack? Where is my backpack? And I just kept telling her, honey, sweetheart, Mama's still looking for it, which technically was true. Technically, it was true. I was still looking for it, but deep down inside, I knew it was like a gone case, you know, it was like lost forever. And the funny thing was, um, I remember one 
One day I was just going to a neighborhood to visit a friend. Um, she was connected to me and I was in a neighborhood which was not my own. It's quite far away from my house. A stranger walks up to me and says, I've been reading your testimonies on Facebook. I want to connect you with a group of moms whom I know would love to support your transition. I get connected to them. I get connected to another stranger. And she says, YJ, if there's anything you need at all, please text me. And I'm so embarrassed. I mean, I don't go around asking strangers for things, right? I, I, I mean, it's embarrassing. Thing. And I, I just didn't want to do it. But day after day passed, I kept drafting and redrafting this text message. And finally, one day I decided, you know what, I'm just going to send it out. I'm just going to say, do you have an extra backpack lying around? It can be used. It can be, as long as it's not like Disney princesses all over, you know, just give me a simple backpack for my child if, if you have one lying around, right? And she texts me back and I start to go ballistic inside because she sends me a picture of the exact same backpack that we had lost. It was a blue owl backpack. And I was so amazed and I asked her, did you know this is the backpack we lost? And she said, well, I was donating a huge bunch of items away to my domestic helper from Philippines and she was going back. I was, I packed everything. And what had happened was that my little daughter had dragged this bag and stuffed it in another room. So this is the only thing that was left behind, literally. And Debbie, I, I don't know, but something in me just broke. God showed me that when we obey him, he cares for our family. And then later on, when I asked a little more about this lady and about this backpack, she told me the history of the backpack. And that backpack had been gifted to her by another family who belongs to our church. Oh. And that family, on a separate separate journey, separate note, actually became like the, the guardians for our children. Now, that, that's a huge thing, right? Like if we ever die in the field, they are the guardians of our children. And we didn't know these two different separate stories. The dots kind of connected. And they were like, what? You mean our backpack flew to that end of the country and is now flying to your country? This little owl has done a lot of miles, eh? <laughs> but, I, but I love that too because um, Sarah Faith, like she got the one thing that mattered the most to her and God yes. restored that. And I love, because yeah. I loved what the Lord said to you. I, I, I see you. I care about that. And I just... Yeah. that. Thank you for sharing that one. I love that. I was like tearing up when I was reading this. I was like, no way, no way. This is so like God. Um, okay. This is another one of my pages that I have, like it's in the chapter about surrendering each step to God. I think I lined almost mm -hmm. highlighted every page in here, but you said this, you said, God treasures his promises. Our dreams matter to him. And it was when it seems like they're too impulsive or far away, when too many uncertainties stand between us and his promised land, God God doesn't want us to give up. He wants us to press in further and take step of faith and surrender, even when we may not know where we're going. And I just, the, I'm, I, I always love how you, I always know you're going to bring a, a really good punch at the end, like really challenging. Um, and then you just kind of ended the chapter really with that Psalm 119 and, um, if it's truly his will, he will help you fly your kite again. What, what would you say to people that have forgotten God's promises and that, that don't think their dreams matter to God anymore? What would you say um, to encourage, to challenge, to deposit faith in them as they surrender those things to God? Wow. Wow, Debbie. All I want to say is, would you... Would you take the time to uncover those buried dreams of yours? Because they are treasures in the soil that God wants to revive and bring to life. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is so timely. Um, I'm about to release, or maybe by the time the podcast is, is released, um, this would, would, would have been shared um, on my Instagram. I'm, I'm releasing a Dream Brave retreat guide a reflection guide and it's for people who feel like they have lost their dreams to kind of go through and unpack that for themselves and one of the first questions i ask is what is your gift what brings you delight you know this year i felt debbie like i i've forgotten how great and important a marker delight is in our journey I forgot how important joy is mm. because so often we keep telling ourselves like 
false narratives like if I push through this I will get where I want to be or I got to do all the things I don't like first so I can go into the college that I want and get a job that I want and it never ends and I feel at some point God just wants us to be real with ourselves and ask us are you happy and sometimes we're like why is happiness even a consideration like that's not even important and it's only so recently that God has been re-speaking to me about that and telling me why do you Joy is a marker. It's one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes we think it's frivolous when it's actually one of the most significant markers of our lives. So if you're unhappy, to whoever's listening to this, if you're feeling unhappy right now, I just pray that God would reveal His signpost to you. Don't suppress your unhappiness. Use it as a signpost to where God might be leading you next. Mm, that's so good. That's so good. This is another one of those um, one liners that I think need to be on like a, a picture to hang on your wall. Um, <laughs> so- and, and you lean into your pain. It, um, your pain will birth something glorious that the Lord said that to you. Um, and and you share you share this beautiful story um, about home birthing your children and not taking pen medication. I was right there with you. I didn't yeah. have birth because that wasn't a thing back wow. then. When I had my kids, but I was not doing pain medication or I hate needles. So that was my thing. But I loved what you shared. And I thought as you lean in, your pain will birth something glorious. And how often we forget that it's through those things that the Lord does the most work, the most beautiful work, because we are surrendering to him. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Thank um, you. Thank you for sharing that, Debbie. Yeah, you're so welcome. I just, there were just so many things. I was like, I wonder if she's thought about doing her art and, and making pictures to hang on the wall with these one liners. It just, I don't know. It just came to me when we were talking. Um, okay. So you, um, you also like, didn't you like create the book cover too? And then they recreated it. Wasn't it like a piece of your artwork and they recreated it for you? Yeah. On the cover? Yes. Yes. So I painted it and then I, I painted the, the cover quite a number of times. Mm-hmm. And when I finally submitted it, the crazy thing was I thought that was the cover. When I painted it, I thought that was it. And then the publisher came back and the graphic designer's name is Dan. Dan returned it to me with a digitized interpretation. It wasn't even a verdict. It was an interpretation of my watercolors. Mm. And that was the cover that you see. And it's quite different from the original painting that I did. It's so much more modern. It's, it's refreshing. But what God showed me, God spoke to me. I actually almost cried when I saw the cover because I was like, wow, God, that is exactly how I would have wanted to see, but I couldn't do it myself. And then I felt the Holy Spirit telling me again, this, isn't that like how we live our lives with dreams sometimes? We aim for one thing, then we do everything we can to achieve it. And then God kind of takes us on a little like adventure ride and kind of rejigs us and say and he said I feel like he's saying sometimes what you think is the best might not be the best and if you just surrender it to me I'll give it back to you but better Mm. so that has happened to me over and over again I think it's one way like I would like I had planned to go to Tanzania like uh, last month we were supposed to be out of here by now but I had an unexpected spine surgery and in my neck and and all these different things came up and I felt God was just telling me why yeah would you just trust me? I have something better for you. And instead of being Tanzania now, um, God launched a book and next week I'm flying to the the States. Um, And through all this, God showed me like, YJ, would you just trust me with your calendar, your schedule? Just trust me with everything. So nowadays I dare not tell people, oh, I'm planning to do this for God. I just tell them I have no plans because if I tell you my plan now, it's going to change next week or something. (laughs) I have, I have my plans and God has his plans. So we're just going to submit to him. I love that. You you see this, this was another one of those great quotes that I pulled out that you said, make room for what you pray for. I want you to expand on that concept for people, because I think sometimes we pray for a lot of stuff, but we don't, as you said, make room for it. So kind of talk about that a little bit. 
Oh my goodness. Ooh, Debbie, I get goosebumps. I have to admit that wasn't originally my quote. I think I saw it from somewhere on Instagram. I don't even know who said it. It was like kind of like a, you know, a little note, a one picture note. And the, the thing is that happened at a time where um, Cliff, my husband, had already encouraged me to um, say yes to the call for assistance in humanitarian work for COVID-19 um, in Africa. So I said yes to the World Health Organization and United Nations, and they said they needed me to wait on where they would post me to. So actually, the first posting that I got was in Congo. And the moment I got that, I was just like so wrecked. I'm like, oh my goodness, Lord, like, I don't even know what to do. Like, I've never been there. I'm so scared. And I needed a day to kind of process that. But the funny thing was, um, shortly after I had submitted to God and I said, God, I will do this for you. Um, the message came back and said, you don't speak French. We have to redeploy you somewhere else. And I was like, phew, you know, that was close. Maybe God was just testing me and it's okay. So, so exactly like what you said, Debbie, I was praying for God to like, you know, enable me to do this. Like this was the big adventure I was going for, right? Like being deployed with the World Health Organization, the UN. That was like my dream when I was 17 years old, when I wrote into medical school, but now it was finally happening. I was too close. And I was like, God, get me out of this. I wasn't making room for him at all. But when the Congo thing happened and then they said I had to be redeployed, that was when I realized oh my goodness, it's not going to be this easy. I have to actually press in. So without actually knowing when they would redeploy me, they said it would be anywhere between one week to like two months, you know. I started packing my bags. Mm. I started putting my luggage together. And I had an empty luggage with just a couple of things inside. And one day out of the blue, my parents just out of, out just, it was so out of the blue, Debbie. They just walked through my door, came to visit with like bags. They did not know that I was going to be deployed. I hadn't told them yet. I was shocked that they came in with bags and bags of clothes that I had brought when I was serving in Uganda. And that was a sign for me. Visually, God was showing me. I had an empty suitcase on the floor. My parents came in with those clothes from Africa, and God just spoke to me, make room for what you pray for, because when I deploy you, it's going to be quick. And I told myself, God, I am going to be ready. Even, even for like this, this so-called book tour to the States, right? I didn't, I didn't plan it. I, I like, it's not, it's not like organized by my publisher or, or anything like that. I literally just felt God telling me, avail yourself. And so I told God, okay, so I mean, it's a two week conversation, right? I said, God, I'll avail 2nd of February to the 21st of February. I'll do anything in the States, any invitations, I'll do it. And up to like last week, which was very close to my trip already, it's like, you know, one or two weeks, I still hadn't filled up the weekends and the days and the maximizer and me is going crazy. I'm like, God, I don't want to waste that trip. Maybe I have to cut short the trip and just fly home. And at the last minute, I kid you not, Debbie, like this was just, this just happened last week when we, we I mean, we, we were so late already. I was thinking, who's going to invite me? People have planned their sermons like weeks and months in advance, right? And this pastor from LA, I, where I would be, um, I connect with him and he tells me that he's already ready to avail the weekend I have left for me to speak because a pastor from Australia, whom I don't even know, had sent to him like a, a screenshot of one of my stories on in Instagram and told him, this lady is coming to California. You got to invite her. And God had prepared all that without me knowing. Mm -hmm. All he wanted me to do was say, God, I avail this for you. Mm -hmm. And so it was my husband and my teammate who said, you are not taking the easy way out. You're not just flying back to Singapore just because there's nothing on. You got to avail that weekend for God. You got to make room for him to work. Mm -hmm. And so whoever is listening in right now, I hope that encourages you that we got to, if we, if we, want to see God's bigness move in our lives. We've got to create space in our lives, right? Because if there's no space, then we're just going to be giving God the leftovers. He's going to have to squeeze in somehow. Mm -hmm. And if I had booked the flight back to Singapore because I said, you know what, God, I don't want the embarrassment of just sitting around in LA waiting for someone to invite me. I'm just going to come home. Then none of that would have happened. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I love that. That is so good. Yeah. That is so good. Um, at the end, I'm just, um, at the end of every chapter, you do such a great job with reflection, but the next steps, and then you give a prayer to go along with each one of the chapters. And this is a thick book. This, this was, 
this was a thick book. I, I like to dive in. I like, I read slow. So, I mean, it's a thick book. It was power packed. Um, it like, why Gia, it was, it was so good. It came at such a time when I needed it. It reaffirmed, um, you know, dreaming big with God, dreaming brave with God, having courage, stepping in. Um, how can people connect with you? How can they get a copy of your book? Thank you for asking, Debbie. I'm excited to share that Dream Brave will be launched by the 30th of January, 2024. And it can be found on Amazon as well as anywhere where books are sold. And if people want to connect with me, my website is kitedreams.org. That's K-I-T-E, like a kite, and then dreams.org. And I'm also most active on Instagram. And that's just my full name, Tam Waijia. So my last name comes first because I'm I'm, I'm from Asia. So it's Tam Waijia, T-A-M-W-A-I-J-I-E. And I love to, um, yeah, I just, I just would love um, to connect with you if you're listening in and if you have um, you know questions about dreaming bravely if you are sensing a nudge in your heart that God is wanting to you to step out to do something more I just pray that this book and its resources will be a blessing mm. yeah so good yeah. so good well Waijia I always like to give like the last just couple minutes to my guest if there was anything that we didn't talk about that Holy Spirit's pressing on your heart or if you want to pray for us uh, to end the podcast to to dream brave with God um, I'm just going to turn this last few minutes over to you thank you Debbie um, I'll just I'll just throw this in because it's happened so recently um, recently when we were you know planning to pack and relocate because we thought it was our big dream I had unexpected spine surgery in my neck they literally had to pull away my breathing pipe and um, the main artery to my heart, I take out a part of my spine and then replace it with titanium. Mm. And that was such a wrecking experience for me. I was down in the valleys asking God what he was really doing. And I just want to encourage um, people who are listening right now that if you are in the midst of a storm and you feel like, wow, God, like this whole dream thing is way too far for me. Like I'm not even surviving day to day. I just want to encourage you that in the storm, in the darkness, is where we find his treasures. Isaiah 45, verse 3, treasures of darkness. Those are the treasures you will find. You will see, you will discover, not in the light, but in the dark. And you may find that those treasures are the exact gems that you will need as your stepping stones to the dreams that God has given you in the future. So I hope that encourages you. Um, dear Lord, I just thank you for this wonderful time together. And I pray for every person who's listening in right now, who's struggling with a, a little dream, a little stirring in their hearts, that God, you would bless and encourage and empower them to dare to put that little dream in your big hands. Because it's not the amount of faith that we have that makes the difference, but it is whom we place that faith in. So Lord, I thank you for Debbie and her ministry. I pray that Lord, you would use all our dreams for the glory of your kingdom as we acknowledge that you are the author of all our dreams. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Oh, Igea, thank you so much for being obedient to God, for writing Dream Brave, for writing and, and really living a, a life of risk and faith and courage and bravery to dream and pursue the things that God has placed on your heart. Your testimony is encouraging to me. I know it's going to be encouraging to everybody else. So just thank you. And thank you for your time. I'm so honored to have you on the podcast. Oh, thank you so much, Debbie. It was my honor. No, oh, thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you. Well, thank you for listening to Dare to Hear the podcast, where we encourage you to dare to hear the voice of God. If you've been blessed at all in any way, we're going to ask that you do a couple of things. First of all, share this podcast episode, because I want to get the message out there far and wide about why Gia and her book, Dream Brave. Then go get yourself a copy of this book because you're going to want it. There are so many truths and so many things to encourage you and challenge you and equip you as you're dreaming brave and having courage to stay step out. And then if you're at a place where you can like us, leave a review, subscribe to us, follow us. We'd love if you could do that until next week, have a blessed week and we'll see you again on another episode until then. God bless and goodbye.
Cause it 